Hello, these notes are your introduction to forensic geology. As you may know, geology is the study of the earth. And in forensic geology, it's really a mixture of a little bit of biology, a little bit of chemistry, a lot of geology, along with a little physics, all wrapped up into one discipline. So the goal of these notes are to give you a little introduction to forensic geology, and then to delve into our first topic in forensic geology, which is going to be soil analysis. So, what is forensic geology? It's a study of evidence relating to minerals, oil, petroleum, and other materials found in or incorporated into the earth. So, soil, glass, water, fossils, that can be used to answer questions raised by the criminal or civil legal systems. Basically, any evidence that comes directly from the earth generally is considered forensic geology. This covers a really, really wide range of materials and substances, and I'm gonna highlight some of the ones that we are gonna focus on in our class. Soil, dirt, mud, sand, glass, metals, oil, and then anything that would be considered a building material like concrete or brick or plaster. Now, it's not going to cover building materials that are wood or plastic based, but there are a lot of construction materials that are mineral based. So, like I said, dirt, sand, glass, often the pieces of evidence we're looking at for glass are broken glass. Here's a broken safe. So, often when you crack open a safe, you get small pieces of metal which can be analyzed. And then, like I said, lots and lots of different construction materials that would fall under forensic geology. The entire goal of forensic geology is to tie a suspect to a crime scene. Now, absolutely, forensic geology evidence is class evidence. How strong of evidence is it? Well, that really, really depends on how many comparison factors we can match between that suspect evidence and the crime scene sample. And the more comparison factors that we can match between the two, the better or more compelling evidence that it is. In terms of where in the crime lab is the forensic geology handled, that would be in the physical science unit of the crime lab. So I want you to think back to unit one when we talked about Locard's principle of exchange, where there's always a transfer of evidence when two things touch. And forensic geology is a perfect example of that principle. Samples of forensic geology evidence can be extremely small or even microscopic. One example is often dust from a suspect's clothing or even inside their ears or nose or soil from underneath their fingernails or their shoes can often be analyzed and compared with soil and dust and glass particles from a crime scene. And one unique thing about this is oftentimes samples from an actual suspect's body can be taken even after they've gone home and they've cleaned up after a crime and they've even taken a shower because some of this evidence can be stuck, like I said, in the nose or the ears, under the fingernails, and doesn't always get washed away easily. So that's just one example of how Locard's principle of exchange directly relates to forensic geology. So forensic geology covers a really wide range of evidence types. But the first part we're going to focus on in class is going to be soil analysis. And we're going to start today, at least, mostly from a physical perspective. And there are six basic tests that we perform on soil evidence. So we're going to cover this today. Next class, we'll look at forensic geology evidence from more of a chemical basis. We'll then spend a day on sand analysis in particular, and we'll wrap up with glass analysis. But today, basic tests that we can perform on soil evidence. So the first thing we look at with soil is just the color. The color of soil is generally related to the composition of the soil, what it's made up of. And I'm gonna show you some examples. So for instance, if we have soil that is white or gray, that means it may contain lime. If it's black or dark gray, it may contain a larger amount of organic materials, or it could be wet. Soil that's red or brown or yellow, that usually means that it's got a higher concentration of iron compounds. So here are some examples of different soils 
and some basic information we can learn about it just from looking at it. Another thing we can learn about soil just from looking at it is the texture. Now I know when you're thinking about dirt, you just think it's dirt, but there are actually three different categories of soil and it again is related to what it's made of or its composition. Those textures are sandy, finely divided, and clay-like. So from left to right here, we've got the sandy on the left. We've got finely divided, which is probably 85% of what you think of as just garden dirt. And then clay-like soil, which, like the name would imply, is very much like clay. Now, along with just the general appearance of the soil, there are other tests we can do to look at the physical properties of the soil. One thing we can do is check the soil's fluorescence. Now, fluorescence basically means we're going to take a UV light, which we can see here is just a little bit more energetic waves than our visible spectrum. And we can shine a UV light onto a soil sample and some components in soil will fluoresce or glow in the presence of a UV light. So here is an example of some minerals which under a UV light are fluorescing. And if we find these minerals in our soil, we have a really good idea of what they're made of just from a visual inspection alone. Another quick test we can do is called biofringence. Now in order to check for biofringence, we're gonna need a special type of microscope it's called a petrographic microscope, and it uses polarized light filters so that we can look for this thing called biofringence in soil samples. Now, in order for you to understand how this works, we have to talk a tiny bit about polarized light. So we're gonna watch this quick animation on YouTube so that you can understand what I mean by polarized light. All right, so we have a light, and when light is emitted, it emits in essentially every direction. And what a polarizing filter does, so you can think of it kind of like a slotted fence where the directionality of the light waves go in every different direction. But a polarized filter is gonna stop the waves from passing unless they line up in the same orientation as the slots. So on the left, we have unpolarized light, and on the right, we have polarized light. A polarizing filter will only let those waves pass that are going in one direction. Now what that means is, and you can see it here, oftentimes different wavelengths of light will travel in different orientations. So red light, blue light, green light, the wavelength that the light is traveling in will determine the color we see that light as. And as you can see, different wavelengths tend to travel at different orientations. So a polarizing filter will tend to block out different wavelengths or colors of light and only let certain ones through. In terms of looking at a sample of soil through polarized light filters, what we're gonna notice is certain minerals will react to the different wavelengths of light, which we now can control because of the polarized light filters, and we'll see different colors emanating from those minerals in our soil sample, which we call biofringence. So let me show you some examples. Here's some clear plastic forks and spoons, and you can see under polarized light filters, we do get kind of that rainbow effect, and those different colors are the biofringence. Now, if we look at it from just a mineral standpoint alone, we can see on the ends of these particular samples, you see some of that same rainbowing effect, and that is the biofringence. Here's another example where you can clearly see some blues and greens, and those aren't colors that you would normally see when you're looking at it with a naked eye, but under a polarized light filter, you can see them. I know that biofringence is something probably brand new to you, and maybe you don't totally understand it, but it will be in one of our future episodes of Forensic Files that we watch, so hopefully it will make more sense to you then in context of a crime. Another test we can do on soil is a simple pH test. Hopefully you remember this from your chemistry class. 
we're just looking at how acidic or basic a soil sample is. We also can check the soil's density. Hopefully you all remember that density is just the mass over the volume. So we can look at a soil sample and see how loosely or compacted it is. And finally, for our last basic observational tests on soil samples, we're just going to call this last category the other stuff. Essentially, what else is in that soil sample that's not actually soil? Often the most identifiable characteristics of a soil sample are going to be these other factors, organic factors potentially, that are included in the soil that aren't actually part of the soil. So things like plant life. Are there leaves in the soil sample? Is there grass? Are there branches or bark? or pollen, all of these organic samples potentially can give us a clue as to where that soil came from. In addition, we might find specific bugs or we might find animal excrement, droppings from different animals, which again can give us a clue as to where that sample came from and or give us one more comparison factor that we can match between a sample found on a suspect and a sample found from our crime scene. So that is it for our simple soil tests. But I also want to share today with you a couple other tests that we can use in forensic geology. And it's not just confined to soil tests. And I didn't really have a good place to fit it in anywhere else. So we're going to tack it here on at the end. And these tests can absolutely be used for soil samples. But we also use them for other samples as well, like glass and metal so I'm just going to run through them really quickly. They are not any kind of test we're going to do in class because they are potentially more dangerous and more complicated and probably most importantly require instruments that we don't have access to here at school. But I do want to mention them. So one of them is called X-ray diffraction. We use a X-ray diffraction machine. It is a powerful non-destructive test but it helps us characterize the crystalline materials that are in our sample. And that can be very useful to look at the actual crystalline structure of a mineral or a metal of a sample in order for comparison. Obviously, we don't have an x-ray diffraction machine here at school, so we won't be doing this. Another one is called arc spectrography. Now, this one is also extremely useful, but potentially very dangerous. This identifies metallic samples through an electrical arc process where we're actually sending electricity through a sample to see how it arcs in order to help us identify metallic samples within things like soil or in metals themselves. And finally, we have differential thermal analysis. This is one of the more commonly used tests in forensic geology. However, it's not something we can do here at school because of the potential danger. And the idea behind this test is we can identify materials based on their melting points. Now, to melt plastic or something like that doesn't take a super high temperature. But when we're talking about melting minerals, melting soil or dirt or rock samples or metal samples, we're talking about extremely, extremely high temperatures, which we are not set up to do here at school at all. But there are machines that allow them to do this in the crime lab safely. And it can be a really, really effective way to match a sample from a suspect to a crime scene. Because if the two samples are made of the identical same material, they will melt at the exact same identical melting point. So it's a really useful test to compare forensic geology samples. So I wanted to mention these three other tests, even though they don't specifically go with soil they are used throughout forensic geology. So that is it for today. Hopefully you feel like you have a basic idea of what forensic geology is and you feel comfortable with some of the basic tests that we use for soil analysis. Next time we'll talk more about forensic geology along with some of the other tests we can do specifically to compare some of the chemical attributes of forensic geology samples.